you know, I'm going to talk about one, our personal journeys, two, about this project called Museum of Solutions, and three, how we're using gaming in, these, in this project. So um, just a little about myself. I studied architectural education in Delhi, and you know, with vision of working in Delhi and you know, building a name for myself. Little did I realize that it, I kept moving in a, you know, in a random fashion. I first moved to Mumbai, where I started teaching and where I started doing research. Then I moved to Vishakhapatnam, close to Hyderabad in this, uh, where I worked and I trained on sustainable development and post-disaster re reconstruction after the earthquakes and the tsunami. Uh, and I also went to Ahmedabad, where I started working on publications, exhibitions, and got interested in this whole uh, aspect of museums. And I moved back to Mumbai in 2010. And that, and my one of my first corporate kind of jobs, I started working with the JSW Foundation. And here I was in, uh, interested with looking after heritage. And so the first real project that I used technology was a project called Kaladham. And Kaladham was an arts kind of space that I was building to promote new media, art, photography, uh, and showcase their journeys in context. So this uh, project basically is what I call, it's, a, it's called Place Humpy. It's a three um, 3D panoramic vision of Hampi, which is a world UNESCO heritage site, and features an interactive tour of this space. So it's like very much like 3D photography, where you are standing, and we use like a gaming tool, and just imagine this is, we built this in 2010, and we actually opened the museum in 2012. So you're standing on this platform, like a game with a joystick, which you can zoom in, zoom out, and the platform itself rotates. And you can see the narrative fold itself in that. So what we did was it draws upon products of cultural imagery and visual language, and more importantly, engages all your senses. So we had music by um, El Subramaniam. We had uh, the experiential encounters of Hampi, both as an historic narrative and a living cultural space through using interactive and immersive technologies. And we used it through a stunning 3D panoramic views. And I'll just show you like the, you know, a small video of it. So you actually wear a 3D glass, step on this platform, and you kind of navigate, it, zoom in to whatever view we had around 11 views. And we also introduce I mean, it's not great animation here. Again, 2010, um, we kind of build in a narrative. So this is a, you're standing on the temple complex and you're having a Ganesh Vandana going through this animation. We also tried to introduce like a Kuchupudi dancer. We mapped him and we kind of put him on the terrace of, a, uh, you know, of the Virupaksha temple and he's performing them. So it kind of brought in children with a new view to heritage and how can you actually encourage people to look at heritage and cultural sites. Um, the next project that I'm going to actually talk to you about is a stunning and dramatic new media art experience called Look Up Mumbai. And here what we did was we actually looked at ceilings of Mumbai's buildings and we kind of, uh, it's not something that you, when you're walking or something, you look after the ceiling. So we wanted to bring that aspect of architecture to the audience. So we mapped through fisheye lens, again in 2015 and 16, important buildings, whether they were monuments, they could be temples, churches, um, they could be everyday buildings, homes, nightclubs. Here you're seeing uh, the airport. Here you're seeing like the Prince of, uh, that's the Gateway of India. Did you ever know that the Gateway of India was actually three domes? Um, and this is VT station. You wouldn't look up at the ceiling. It has a very nice star graze uh, ceiling on it. And what we did was, again, um, we were going to display this in the Prince of Wales Museum. And the Prince of Wales Museum itself has this beautiful dome at its, um, you know, in the lobby. And we thought we'll project these images on the dome, also reflect them, 
they have a fountain below and we thought we'll remove the fountain, put a mirror below. So you'd see simultaneously the images going up on the ceiling and below. So you will get an, a different kind of experience and a look to, you know, um, we kind of randomly kind of did an AI logarithm which changed the images very randomly. So every time you saw the experience, you actually saw a different view in a different building. Um, uh, but actually, when we actually tried executing this, it was about money, it was about the technology, it was about the time frame. So we kind of had to adapt ourselves and we actually used a small traveling dome with kind of the ceiling and we made a very custom kind of couch that you could lie down on and it was custom made and the digital then um, images in that enveloped this content in before your eyes, ever changing, fresh look. So it kind of was a very popular exhibit for a month. Hi everyone, my name is Vineet Nikum and I'm an architect generally used to talking to design crowds, but this is a gaming forum. I'm also the founder of uh, Vitolage Bombay. So we, our work tries to look at space through the mediums of games, digital design, installation art. So few of the things that we are really interested in is the narrative aspects of game and storytelling. And a little bit about my journey as to how I'm so deeply interested in storytelling. In 2009, I... Can you repeat the name of your company? I don't get it. Bricolage. Bricolage Bombay. Yeah. So uh, a little bit of my journey, it starts in 2006 when I graduated as a fresh architect. And uh, from there, I moved to film school in 2009 in Pune and I studied direction. And from there, cut to 2019, uh, 13, where I kind of moved to New York at Cornell, where I kind of looked at new media, art, and architecture as like my master's program. And uh, that, that led to a whole journey. And then in the end, uh, I went to Delhi, where I was offered like a fellowship to do a first independent art game, uh, which was developed in Khirki with Coach. And then it got showcased at the South Bank show. And it was one of the first art games developed in the country in, in the year 2015. So I'll just talk a little bit about Kirki uh, as a project. So Kirki is this uh, neighborhood in Delhi where uh, it's actually a very funny neighborhood. You have a very big mall called Select City Walk Mall. And Kirki is, the mall, uh, Kirki is a neighborhood in front of it. And it has issues of migrants and gentrification happening very seriously and very fast. So there's a huge African community that lives there. So we started the project as a community project. So as an architect, usually the tools that I really use is drawings and interviews. But this time we chose to use game as a method to express the issues of Kirki. So this game which was developed called Kirki 20, uh, 2027 is actually about, uh, it's actually like a first person shooter kind of uh, thing. It was developed on the first person shooter platform, but is, it, it's not about shooting, it's about stories. So every story is told like a haiku or like a 10 page, 10 worded story. And it, it's based in this dystopian future of Kirki. It's actually a story that is narrated uh, that has issues of uh, issues of identity, racial politics, and gender. And I was more interested in how a to story can be told in space. So the way the game uh, logic was developed is, it's a two acre by two acre site, which has about 20 stories. And based on your wandering, or based on the way a player kind of wanders the navigation, uh, the landscape of Kirki, the game tells you a little bit of a different story about the area. Okay, and the story is told through the lens of a girl called Ify. Who's, a, who's this African girl that we used, and actually the audio is off in this, but she basically, it's, it's 10 stories, uh, 20 stories in her life told through 10 lines, and a part of every, as you wander deeper and deeper into the space, the game starts telling you what she felt, in the sense where you kind of, it's a, like a cross between uh, role play and understanding geography or uh, that kind of stuff. So. During the wanderings, you may come across the home of the girl, the parts of the neighborhood she frequented in, and if lucky, the people she loved the most. And if you longer wander long enough, the stories, the dates, and the etc. leads you to the exact sequence of events that led to this dystopian Kirki. Okay? So the next project that I'm going to talk about, uh, yeah, yeah. 
Hmm? Can we have the questions after the talk? Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to ask. Uh, just, uh, so, I'm so sorry. The, the reason why we have the Q&A in Mojo is because we do recording. So, we don't disturb that flow. But please do stay along and we will uh, address the question just in 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah? Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. So, the next project is also a very, very intense project. It was developed uh, along with Columbia University. Uh, and it actually looks at the life of Ambedkar. Ambedkar is a very prominent Indian historic uh, personality and he lived two parallel lives in Mumbai and New York. His education was in New York City. So this project kind of brought together the geographies that he lived in Mumbai and in New York. So uh, during this, this, this project we looked at or we mapped literally the entire city of Bombay from Dadar to Church Gate and we looked at the different Maidans and the Chawls and the Dalit movement that happened in these geographies. So the project started with looking at spatial geographies where this Indian freedom movement according to Ambedkar's Dalit movement happened. Uh, the final installation, I'm not like going to go so deep into the process, but the final installation was like this 20 foot long interactive wall where we wanted people to kind of understand how Ambedkar at different points in different years worked or lived in different parts of Mumbai. So you see some of them are actually chawls on the wall. Some of these were interactive screens that were sensor activated. And instead of having drawings or maps or any kind of historical narrative like newspaper clippings, we kind of interacted or we made the user interact with uh, the Dalit history of Mumbai through these interactive installations. So I'll just kind of show you a few clippings of what these TVs kind of talked about. This one specific, there are 19 films like these, but this one specific, uh, specific film that I'm showing you talks about the housing conditions of the Dalit movement. So this is actually a compilation of historical footage and 3D modeling and actual uh, site documentation to kind of let the user understand what the space was, what it is right now, and what it used to be, and what how historical narrative kind of uh, uh, represented it as. So this is some of the. So this is about the BIT chores. Then there are more uh, more slides and more TVs, in, interactive TV installations that we made that looked at Maidans and that looked at different parts of uh, Ambedkar's life. So yeah, coming to. 2017 when yeah we both joined together at that moment uh, on a new very exciting project called the museum of solutions and this was the time where i was interested in how we could draw uh, emotional responses and attitudes and mind shift behaviors in children specifically uh, to get a better world in in its social and environment context today and Vineet wanted to explore how the physical materiality can make architecture more fluid. So this was a project that we kind of built, you know, have been working on since 2017. And it is called Museum of Solutions, which is a unique experiential children's museum going to open next year in Mumbai. And our vision here is to inspire, enable and empower children to make meaningful change in the world together today. Uh, it's a very state of art kind of new building and we've kind of uh, taken best practices from across the world and from this museum we hope to create exhibitions, activities and programs that encourage children and their adults and parents to actually ask questions, to seek challenges and then together to work towards solving problems and developing their own unique skills. And the programmatic requirement of the building made us want to do like a public facade or a more public open area on the ground floor. And we kind of put the parking and utilities in the middle area and then on the top floors is actually what we call the museum. So this leads certified building. Basically, we uh, the building started as a simple project and has become uh, a big project right now. So this lead certified building will demonstrate how through exhibitions and educational educational gamified interactives 
how uh, built fabric or built built environments can actually take gamification inside them and ideas of sustainability and human centered design have been embedded into the design of the building so it will be a living example for the community how what is possible if we work to get together for with a sustainable future in mind so the in in all totally the building kind of has 1 lakh square feet of built up spaces of which there are different kinds of interactives and uh, exhibitions in different kinds of areas so when we started the project in 2017 uh we had several concepts as to what a building that should kind of appeal to children and work with children be like so we wanted it to be a box of curiosities we wanted the facade to be a museum or the museum to be a facade we wanted the whole building to be an exhibit and most importantly we wanted to create these digital interactive gamified experiences with the, within the architecture of the building so a lot of the spaces of the building have been left really simple such that the interactiveness and the new media is kind of enhanced through the design of the space so these are some shots of the building i'm not going to go into the detail it's a very very tight plot you guys know how bombay is and it's right next to uh, this neighborhood called kamla mills next to ikea in mumbai this is the visual of the f- area that we call feel which is open spaces then there is a huge uh, lobby in the ground floor which is also a multi purpose auditorium that is like democratic and open for anyone to come in and is not ticketed which also gives a sneak preview of the exhibits of the museum there are open desks hello desks and then there are a series of continuous museum spaces that kind of were de- designed as labs for the museo idea to kind of work so so the kind of model that we wanted you know when children come to the museum they have to go back and say what did they do at the museum so uh, we kind of came up with a simple kind of sentence that we children could use to explain this idea so the sentence goes on like i play with friends we discover the world around us connect with issues i care about and make solutions and take action for a better world so it became basically about play discover connect make so yeah and then we literally took this engagement statement of the museum and it's developed into like labs that are spanning across the top four, four floors of the building called the play lab which actually encourages physical play for kids of one age group then we have something called discover and discover is actually a floor where we want exhibits to have thematics and kids to kind of discover problems around them and most of our uh, problem statements are from the un sdg then we have a make lab so that kids and children can kind of make solutions so i'll kind of yeah so play is all about having fun interacting with stem helping you think through a problem experimenting and just playing so we have like a vertical climber in place the make lab is about prototyping making solutions so we have kind of different studios for robotics for uh for art for recording rooms we have tech so we have a whole lot of maker space kind of curriculum but it's really the discover flow which is about seeing the complexity of the world around you and finding things that you are passionate about and along with discover in this flow is a connect section which is finding about what ideas how you link to them what appeals to you personally and what you want to address and solve and explore further so uh while the engagement model is all about fun and play and learning it's also about the real world and what is happening in the world today so uh, what we thought was that on discover we have around 50 exhibits and they're all interactive and immersive and some are physical some are digital but they are all centered around the un sustainable development goals and the goals that address children specifically are these 11 goals that we picked out and rather than go in and the, you know it's very difficult like you can say life on land life on water but they're actually all linked or sanitation so we kind of found a common thread and we used the first thread of water as the first interlying element to kind of address the issue so the exhibits are all on water when it opens and here we actually divided this floor into the connect zone and in the discover element there are three main areas called immersive empathy and investigation 
the immersive zone is an experience where the child experiences the wonders of the world, natural resources, and how our actions have affected these natural ecosystems with a view to explore solutions and respect and preserve them. So it's about more about the environmental issues of water. In empathy, we talk about giving children information through people, through stories, through objects, uh, and offer a wide range of voices and perspectives to uh, you know, find a cross-cultural understanding between them so that they bring out a more proactive approach. And the investigation is all about role playing. They actually, it's like an escape room where you get clues, where you kind of build your own team and you kind of go through this mission and it takes you to solve a problem in that. And in that, you learn. Yeah. The design of the space was done entirely you know, using Unreal Engine. One of the things that we as an architecture studio started doing uh, in 2017 is we started updating ourselves with all these new technologies because no longer was it only about designing simple spaces. These spaces had several kind of stakeholders and consultants working on it together and to kind of get all of this information in one place and kind of collate it in one software was one of the issues. The second thing that we wanted to work with was with ideas of sound and graphics. So that was in. And also something like this doesn't exist anywhere in India. And it was very difficult to prototype and mock and kind of to show to the clients also to show to different types of people how this will work and how this would kind of pan out. So the Discover Floor is designed in a, in a way where the same carcass can be used to talk about a different problem. So in another two years, maybe uh, apart from water, maybe we can talk about something like forests. And the technologies that we used were ranging everywhere from interactive walls, VR simulations, immersive walls. And uh, so that's like the, the way we kind of worked with several, several design partners to make this uh, a reality. And one of the things that we've been focusing on is kind of reducing the amount of technology where we constantly talk about digital technology and its meaningful use to create experiences that will change the world and also the children that they, children that they interact with. Yeah. So I'm going to take you through three different experiences in this museum. The first is what we call the interconnected wall. It's a multi-sensorial experience showcasing, showcasing the life cycle of water. And these are just the references that we drew on how could you showcase something when you're viewing at a distance and how would you interact with it. So the intent of the exhibit is really to educate the visitor about the life cycle of water, how it comes, where it comes from, how it travels through the world in its ecosystem, and how do we use it and how do we dispose of it. So that was basically what we wanted to show in our content. And we wanted this as a wall feature. We wanted it to be multi-user experience. So we kind of decided that maybe we'll have this experience mapped out as three different panels, not visually, but like uh, figure graphically on the wall and three children at least could interact with it at one point of time. So we kind of created this uh, you know, a graphic visual information across the wall describing how water, the cycle really works from the sun to, you know, how it comes through the lakes and rivers, how it goes into and how it comes into your city and then how the drainage system works. And these were supported by, you know, these interactions where, where, where we had these hands, you could actually like a hotspot or a sensor, and you could actually then get more information and, uh, you know, interact with it. But, you know, the language was very game-like and uh, a little not within our Brad guidelines. So we kind of started rethinking on the exhibit, the interaction. What is exactly that we want to focus our attention on? And we thought, you know, everybody learns about how rain comes and how the seeds are get. But let's, it's actually, do you know how water reaches your tap? That was what became critical to us. And it was just about how does it come from the lake or the river that's close to your city into your tap. And that's what we focused on. So we kind of built a whole visual narrative on this. And every time you kind of interact with this, with different points, it kind of shows how the water kind of moves within it to different cities, what it brings to life and how it goes through our pipes and the different processes of chlorif a clarification or you know testing or filtration kind of keeps 
uh, and the you know various places, the inlet bay, the reservoirs, how it goes, and finally how it reaches the tap at the museum. And so we kind of uh, did this to kind of actually tell children to reflect. It is such a long process. There are actually 50 kilometers or more. I mean, if the pipes just circle, it was 50 times the earth. If you put water pipes that circle, uh, amount of pipes that you use in the water. So these are the kind of information that we wanted to give the children. And it's not. Uh, it's also about how we place it in context. So this is the wall and the different hands. And you know, we had as long as you don't, we've kind of disabled the next hand touch point when one person, but multiple people. As long as you're doing alternate uh, touch points, you can interact with this exhibit. The next exhibit that we're talking about is called Water and Me. And basically in this exhibit, it's about uh, uh, how water, uh, how you can understand your own choice of how and your own habit and lifestyle and consumption patterns of water. And so visitors were, you know, the digital screens are embedded into something called like a water meter screen. And there were various and the experience at the back end lets you calculate a certain after answering a certain number of questions uh, that you submit what is the positive message about your water habits that we want to convey to you and so there are a, a huge variation of kind of questions that we want to ask children how do you just bathe i mean do you use the shower do you use the tap do you use directly from the like a bucket, bar tub. And we kind of tried to tell them how much water is consumed. Even though I might have selected just the shower option, I would li like to know what the other patterns and how much water. And sometimes the choices could involve, that, oh, you would use some together as a multi-select option and what your options again were. And also it's about reinforcing this constant idea. So even like the screen savers or whatever we want, we want you to constantly remember that water is a precious commodity. Uh, and of course, you want the museum to be inclusive, accessible. So we kind of use different languages. And finally, when we actually develop the whole game, uh, it's like a game that you play in the museum and there are multiple people who can play it and it's an again random people get random questions so we divide it into five categories and in each category there are five questions so every time you come back to the museum you actually uh, get a different question and maybe you will make a choice next time different from what you've done before and with that reference answer you might be able to actually explore uh, and create a mindset mindset shift in your behavior. And so this playful experience of design combines really uh, the physical and the digital technology uh, to capture the visitor's attention through content engagement and animation. It reflects on your choice and your actions and your behavior. So this is how it's set in context at the museum. And again, it's also about like exploring various settings. Should it look like a shaft or a shaft of pipes? Should it have color? Should what should the materials be like? And what should really be the signage? And how should we convey that to children. So it's about calculating maybe your water footprint or something like that. And the last exhibit that I'm going to talk to you about is called the depth wall. It's an experience that includes two large digital screens mounted on a wall in the immersive zone. Visitors have an opportunity to explore um, and learn about life across different levels of the ocean using this technology. And so, the intent is to ignite the visitor's curiosity, senses and other, uh, and offer value through the kind of information we want to give. So uh, it's basically going down into the ocean. And uh, the more you go through gestures, through your hand movement, you kind of learn about life that lives in these oceans through quizzes and context. And so every time you kind of have a narrative, a pop-up comes out, which tells you more about the animal, the images, or its location, or fun facts, or some video content. So it's like basically a 
quiz game and we've kind of mapped out at every level a different kind and we've created this kind of you know a large thing so with the swipe you kind of this is the environment we've created and these are the kind of creatures that we intend to inhabit these oceans and the kind of questions that you know some of the questions are like can you find a fish with no bones so i mean you kind of look and you might get a wrong answer or right but you learn in that process you learn some other fact about an animal or a relative of a bat or something like an uh, octopus something more about uh, you know who has night vision so there are different questions and through this kind of uh, gamification technique you learn about the oceans um yeah, in conclusion, the whole Discover floor has a lot of more exhibits like this in all the four zones. So what Preeti described you was only one exhibit in the Connect zone and only one exhibit depth wall in the Immersive zone. So we are pretty excited about uh, the whole museum project as such because we are getting to put together something that is just a dream. So this one visual is about another game in uh, a zone called the Investigation Zone which has these control stations on which a movie plays that gives clues to the kids about a uh, water game. Uh, but what we actually believe is that we want this Muso project to be like a familiar cutting edge. We've used a lot of familiar and cutting edge techniques to prime children for collaboration and for design thinking and risk, uh, risk taking and out of the box thinking. So the right balance of enjoyment and challenge is what makes games such an amazing tool for design and learning. And in conclusion, with the digital world becoming more and more closer and these experiences would not be left only to the mobile screens, but to kind of buildings also that would have, be, uh, that would have to be constructed and disseminated along with various immersive platforms and initiatives. So just to uh, end, uh, we kind of are going to open this museum next year. We invite you to follow us and our progress on Instagram and uh, it's been an 11 year journey for me personally yeah. and six years of working together with Vineet on this project and we hope to all see you and physically there when we open next year. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a lot and it was like already, oh my God, there's so much to process, but beautiful concepts and uh, so much to talk about. So I am just going to open up the floor for you uh, for questions. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just take it. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm Karthik. I work as a, a game producer. So uh, my question is from a very conventional video game perspective. So do you make the narrative first and that allow it to dictate the gameplay or do you have a gameplay separate and then you merge it with the narrative? So we actually find what is the real objective that we want to convey to the child. So it's the learning outcome of the game that, you know, surpasses everything for us. So what is it that we want the learning outcome to be? And that is what dictates the narrative, the technology and the design. So you don't have a narrative which is already in place? No. All right. Cool. I mean, it's what we want to teach the children about really. And what we want them to reflect or learn about is what directs everything here. I don't know whether that answers, but that's the start point that we use. And yes, we do find technologies that can help doing that as a narrative process. Uh, and maybe, you know, if existing games that exist, can we modify them? All come in that process. But it is the learning outcome, which is the starting point. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing this story. I had no idea such wonderful things were happening in Mumbai and elsewhere. Uh, my question is, okay, you're opening this next year. Yes. How are you going to get the kids in? So actually, we already have like a small mini space that we created for workshops. Uh, we actually have a set of children ourselves who have, we have tested. They are like our best stakeholders. So we have like a group. They are our advisors. And every exhibit is prototyped, put out there, their feedback taken. And this has been going on for the last three years. So we have like three, four batches of at least 100 children and we kind of call them, you know, on weekends and do that. But we are also going to schools. So we have tie up with schools. So when we open, hopefully we will have 
like two school visits from different age groups. So it's been like a field trip. We've kind of done an itinerary of four, like four hours of what you could do, like a half an hour of play, half an hour of this. So we've kind of curated journeys. And of course, uh, a lot of it is up to an individual and what they take back. So I think in museums, you really cannot say what I learned. And, you know, I've been going to museums since I was a kid but I didn't realize how much they impacted me till much later in life. And I think these are things that you don't know what will impact a child. So you're going to leave it to a broad kind of narrative and maybe something will connect with you. Something might connect with them, which is different, but it will stay with you. And that is hopefully what we kind of hope the next generation. We are very, and I think, you know, when we started the museum, we had one line statement, which we all believed in that adults today have failed to solve the problems of the world. Let's give children yeah. a chance. Yeah. And that was where the ideology of Museum of Solutions, we never wanted to call it a museum also. It was more uh, because I'd grown up and most of us have grown up in museums not being able to touch and feel. Yeah. But I think that narrative is also something we wanted to change. And India has a legacy of science museums, but they are like outdated. They, they don't talk about relevant issues. Yeah. And this is actually first of its kind kind of project that we wanted to work together with where different stories or different narratives or different exhibits could talk about real world problems so that's the name and to answer her question what she was what you were asking about this these kids are from different age groups in that advisory group that muso has put together so they are kids from municipal schools and there are kids from middle age income parents and then there are kids from high, uh, the kind of luxury segment and all of them kind of play, test, interact and these exhibits were developed over long periods of time. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a space for features exhibition? Yes. So in the, we have a space on the first floor. I mean, I didn't take you through the details. I don't want to bore you with like something that we've been yeah. working on for five years. So they have an exhibit, uh, temporary exhibit space. So we can build an, in fact, we are already in talks with um, with Ocean Odyssey. We're talking with uh, planet, uh, planet Earth. So we want to get certain exhibits which are abroad. And we've done a lot of collaborations with international. There has been an Australian firm which has worked with us. There's been a uh, firm from New York who specialize in children because I don't think, but what we want to also focus is build in-house uh, talent. So we don't really want to take everything from abroad. So we are actually going at a slower pace, picking up Indian. So any of you looking at game designer job in our, we're also available. <laughs> <laughs> I have yeah. a follow up question, which is a personal question, but hopefully others will, uh, will uh, find it useful too. So you have, 300 young play testers. Yes. Other people designing games for young people, serious games, educational games, can games for children. Can we, can we, like say, can we have your children play test our games? <laughs> we could definitely. And once the museum opens, yeah. definitely we want to do that. So we are tying up with industry partnerships to even test products, ideas, because we will have that database and that children, you know, and give them a chance. So we want to build that. So like, I mean, like, you know, yeah. I think uh, Creon, what is the company? Camelin came up to me that, yeah. you know, the packaging, can your children help us with the packaging and the colors they like, you know, things like that is definitely something that we want children to have a voice to words because they are the ultimate users tomorrow. And let me tell you, they are beyond you and me. You know, uh, I was amazed, like one of the first I think in one of our panels, we asked a child, like, you know, how do you cut an apple without a knife? And everybody came up, how would you do that? How would you cut an apple without a knife? knife. Just repeating her question. <laughs> yeah, it was just a question that one kid, so someone said, we'll bite it, throw it. Use it. One kid says, I will print it on paper and cut it with the scissors. I was like, I didn't even think of the apple as not being a physical apple. Like, you know, I mean, that is the bias that we come from, which children don't have. So they are more honest. They're able to look at a problem very differently from us. Yeah. And uh, sadly for children of India, there's very little f digital spaces yeah. that are available. So it's either role play things like kids in or some other stuff, or there is dumb entertainment spaces. So there's no meaningful experiences that kids can have that are not on the cell phone or not on a digital device. And that is what the Muso project kind of tries to 
bring to life. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running yes. out of time. Uh, okay, we'll take one last question. We'll take question. one quick one. Yeah. Uh, do you think about uh, rural childrens? So yes, yes. we yes. did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is, uh, so as a foundation, more, definitely yeah. we did think about it. So we thought let's build a flagship. and we are looking at taking you know some of these exhibit some of these experiences and we're trying to look at taking them out so it's not only about this physical space it's also about reaching out to people there and getting them to come and experience so yes we will look at that in the long term but right now i think our energies are focused on building this building uh, and yes yeah. opening it next year but yes that's a thought okay. thank you so much and thank you